So let's now look at oxides of sulfur. So for sulfur, we see that we have two main oxides, whereby the first oxide of sulfur is always sulfur 4 oxide, and then the next one is sulfur 6 oxide. So let's begin with the first one, which is sulfur 4 oxide. So for the sulfur, uh, sulfur 4 oxide, we see that this is mainly obtained by reacting dilute nitric acid with sodium sulfite. So as this happens, there's the evolution of sulfur 4 oxide, water, and sodium chloride, which is going to be formed. So as you can look at this experiment, you'll see that we are reacting dilute hydrochloric acid with sodium sulfite in a round bottom flask. So heat in this process is used in order to speed up the rate of this reaction. So heat will act as a catalyst. So the resulting gas is then passed through concentrated sulfuric acid and then collected using the downward delivery method. So the gas which is being collected in this case will be sulfur dioxide. So the function of the concentrated sulfuric acid is to dehydrate or is to remove the traces of water vapor from the sulfur for oxide gas that has been formed. So anytime in an exam, if you see a gas being passed through conch sulfuric acid, always know that the conch sulfuric acid is acting as a dehydrating agent. So it is dehydrating the gas. To dehydrate means to remove water vapor or water traces from the atmosphere. So the sulfur dioxide is collected using the downward delivery method or the upward displacement of air. As you can see, these are the gas collection methods that we have. So the sulfur dioxide is collected using the downward delivery method or the upward displacement of air. As well, we have uh, the other gas collection methods. We have the overwater method and the upward delivery. So why is it that sulfur four oxide or sulfur dioxide is collected using the downward delivery method? So it is collected using this method because first of all, it is denser than air. Basically, it is denser than air. That's why it's collected using this method. So as you can see, we have potassium dichromate, uh, potassium dichromate paper in the gas jar. So what's the function of the potassium dichromate? So the potassium di dichromate will change color to green, indicating that the gas jar is now full of sulfur dioxide. So if the gas jar will be full of sulfur dioxide, so the potassium dichromate is going to be reduced and change color from orange to green. So if it changes color to green, therefore we are going to say that uh, the gas jar is now full of sulfur dioxide. So the gas is dried again by passing through uh, Kong sulfuric acid. Don't forget that. And heat is used to act as a catalyst in this reaction. So uh, you can look at the, uh, the reaction. So that's the reaction which is taking place in this experiment. So apart from that, we see that sulfur oxide can also be prepared by reacting copper tannins with uh, dilute sulfuric acid. So if we react the copper tannins with dilute sulfuric acid, we are also still going to get sulfur oxide gas. But in this case, we are going to get sulfur oxide gas plus water molecules plus copper sulfate, uh, which is in solution form. So the gas, remember, it can be reacted by rea uh, it can be prepared by reacting dilute hydrochloric acid with sodium sulfite. As well, it can be prepared by reacting copper tannins with dilute sulfuric acid. So let's look at the physical properties of sulfur oxide. So the first physical property of sulfur oxide is that it is denser than air, and that's why it's collected using the downward delivery method. So it is denser than air. As well, we see that sulfur oxide is a colorless gas. Just as the carbon oxide is a colorless gas, sulfur oxide is also a colorless gas. And sulfur oxide, the other property is that it has a pungent smell. So it is smelly. So the gas has a smell. The smell is pungent. As well, we see that it has a boiling point of negative 10 degrees Celsius and a melting point of negative 75 degrees Celsius. Apart from that, we see that it is highly soluble in, in water, having a molecular mass of 64 grams. So why do we say that it has a molecular mass of 64 grams? So remember, the mass of sulfur is 32 grams. The mass of one oxygen molecule is uh, 16 grams. And in this case, if you write the chemical symbol of sulfur oxide, it is SO2. So it will mean that we have one sulfur and then we have two oxygen. So one sulfur being 32 grams plus two oxygen, that is 16 times 2, we have 32 plus 32. So if you add 32 plus 32, we are going to get now the molecular mass of the compound, which is sulfur oxide, whereby the molecular mass is 64 grams. And that is the molecular mass of sulfur oxide, which is 64 grams.
Then lastly, we see that it is soluble in water. So sulfur oxide is highly soluble in water. So apart from the physical properties, let's now look at the chemical properties of sulfur four oxide. So for the sulfur four oxide, we see that the first chemical property is reaction with water. So what happens when sulfur four oxide reacts with water? So you see that sulfur four oxide reacts with water to form sulfurous acid. And how to react the sulfur four oxide with water? We use an inverted funnel. So we use this inverted funnel in order to prevent sucking back of water inside the tube. So that's why you use a very, a very broad funnel in order to prevent water from being sucked back into the tube. So why would water be sucked back inside the tube? It's because sulfur oxide is highly soluble. So water molecule will, all, will always try to follow the path of sulfur oxide. And in this case, if we use a narrow tube, sulfur oxide is always going to, uh, I mean, water is always going to be sucked inside. So we are using an inverted funnel uh, like whereby its surface is broad in order to prevent water from sucking back into the tube as it follows the path by which sulfur is taking. That is the reaction whereby if we react sulfur oxide with water in an equilibrium reaction, we are going to get sulfurous acid which is in aqueous form. So you see that when this acid reacts with sodium hydroxide, it forms a normal salt and an acid salt. So it will form those two types of salts. It will form a normal salt as per the reaction. So we're going to get that first one, which is the normal salt, and then we're also going to get an acid salt. So in the topic of salts, we say that acid salts, these are salts which contain a replaceable hydrogen atom. So if an acid, uh, if a salt contains a replaceable hydrogen atom, that is an acid salt. We have, for example, this sodium hydrogen carbonate, we have potassium hydrogen carbonate, calcium hydrogen carbonate, so as long as it has a hydrogen, replaceable hydrogen, that automatically, remember we say that it becomes an acid salt. So apart from reaction with water chemical property, let's look at the next chemical property of uh, sulfur oxide, which is the bleaching action of sulfur four oxide. So it is not only chlorine which is used for bleaching, also sulfur oxide can be used for bleaching. So you see that sulfur oxide bleaches by reduction process. It combines with the moisture in the presence of oxygen to form sulfuric acid. As you can see in the reaction, we have sulfur oxide reacting with water in an equilibrium reaction, and in the presence of excess oxygen, we get sulfuric acid. So you see that this sulfuric acid reduces dye of the color or the, the dye which is found inside the product. Whereby, if we react the sulfurous acid, so in limited oxygen, we get sulfurous acid. So if we react this sulfurous acid, plus a dye, we are going to get sulfuric acid plus a colorless material. So what happens is that this acid is going to reduce the compounds found inside the dye. As itself, it will be oxidized to sulfuric acid plus a colorless material. So that is how the sulfur oxide is used in bleaching. So it reduces the other and then it, it is oxidized in the process. Oxidized from sulfurous acid to being sulfuric acid plus a colorless material. So apart from that, let's now look at another chemical property, which is let us see whereby this is reducing action of sulfur for oxide. So the reducing action. So how does it reduce? How does it play part in the reduction process? So we are going to look at the different chemicals, the different materials. So the first one, let's look at reaction with potassium dichromate solution. So how is it able to reduce potassium dichromate solution? So you see that sulfur oxide is a very strong reducing agent apart from carbon-2. It is a very strong reducing agent. So this reduction process takes place in the presence of water. So dry sulfur oxide gas is unable to reduce. But if you have moist sulfur oxide gas, therefore it is able to reduce anything in its presence. The acidified potassium dichromate turns orange to green. So after it has been reduced, it will change color from the normal orange then being reduced and then it will be green in color. So the reduced dichromate is green in color. So the chromate six ions, as you can see, is reduced to chromium three. Uh, so the chromate six, yes, the chromate six ions will be reduced to chromium three, whereby this chromium three will now be green in color. The chromate six will be uh, orange in color and then after being reduced to chromium three, so the chromium three will now be, will now be green in color.
So the sulfate ions which are SO3 will then be oxidized from being SO3 to being SO4. So that's how it happens. So the sulfur oxide, the sulfate ions will be reduced from SO3 to SO4. So this happens that the sulfur oxide must be moist. So as much as the sulfur oxide is moist, if it reacts with the acidified potassium dichromate, what really happens is that it reduces the orange dichromate, which is dichromate 6, to acromium 3, which is green in color. In this process, we'll see that the SO3, the sulfite ions, will be oxidized to SO4, which are the sulfate ions. So what really happens is that it reduces the other as itself it is being oxidized. So that's, that's exactly what happens. And you can see in the reaction whereby potassium dichromate is reacting with sulfur oxide in the presence of an acidic medium to get the chromium sulfate plus potassium sulfate plus water molecules. So that is all about the reducing properties of sulfur four oxide uh, by using uh, potassium dichromate or using the dichromate ions. So Roman to the reducing properties, let's look at reduction with acidified potassium permanganate solution. So we see that sulfur oxide also reduces potassium permanganate. So it reacts with acidified potassium permanganate, which discolorizes its purple color to a colorless color, as you can see in the equation, whereby sulfur oxide reacts with potassium permanganate in the presence of an acid to get potassium sulfate, manganese uh, 2 oxide plus sulfuric acid. So what really happens is that it reduces the permanganate and itself it is oxidized to another uh, foreign substance. So you see that the purple manganate 7 ions uh, will be reduced to colorless manganese 2 ions. So that's exactly what will happen. So the permanganate ions, uh, the permanganate 7 will be reduced to manganese 2 ions on the expense of sulfur oxide being oxidized. So apart from that, let's look at the, uh, the other reducing property whereby we have reduction with bromine water. So as well, the bromine is going to be reduced. So the red-brown color of the bromine liquid is discolorized immediately when you bubble in the sulfur four oxide gas. So the bromine liquid is reduced to hydrobromic acid and then the sulfur four oxide will be oxidized automatically to sulfate ions. So that's exactly what happens. So it reduces bromine to hydrobromide, uh, hydrobromide ions or hydrobromide acid, which is HBr. It will reduce the bromine to hydrobromic and as well it will be oxidized from sulfate, uh, from the sulfur 4 to a sulfate ion. So that's exactly what happens as per the reaction as you can see in the reaction. So if bromine reacts with, uh, reacts with water or bromine reacts with moist sulfur 4 oxide, you are going to get hydrobromic acid plus sulfuric acid. So the bromine will be reduced to HBr and then the sulfate, the sulfur oxide will be oxidized to sulfate ions as per the reactions as you can see. So apart from that, let's look at the next one, the reduction property of sulfur oxide, whereby we have reaction with concentrated nitric acid. So reaction with concentrated nitric acid, whereby we see that when sulfur oxide is bubbled through concentrated nitric acid, brown fumes of nitrogen oxide will be formed. So the sulfur oxide is going to reduce nitric acid to nitrogen oxide as per the reaction. So the sulfur oxide will reduce nitric acid to nitrogen oxide and as well it will be oxidized from sulfur 4 to sulfate ions. So remember, the nitric acid is reduced to brown nitrogen oxide while the sulfur oxide is oxidized from being sulfur oxide to being sulfate ions in high, um, hydrochloric, not hydrochloric, in sulfuric acid, yes, sulfuric acid which is H2SO4. So apart from that, uh, the, next, uh, the next reducing property, let's look at uh, reaction of sulfur oxide with ion 3 chloride. Yeah. Let's look at reaction of sulfur oxide with ion 3 chloride. So like whereby we see the yellow ion 3, ion 3 chloride will change color immediately to green. So the yellow ion 3 chloride is going to change color to green when sulfur oxide will be bubbled inside it. So this is because the sulfur oxide reduces yellow ion 3 chloride to pale green ion 2 ions. So that's basically what happens. So the sulfur oxide is going to reduce the ion 3 chloride to green ion 2 
ions as per the reaction. So the ion 3 chloride is reacting with sulfur foxide, which is moist. That's why we write plus H2O. So that means that sulfur foxide must be moist. Remember, dry sulfur foxide cannot be able to react in this reaction. The sulfur foxide must be moist. So that's why the equation is ion 3 chloride plus SO2 plus H2O. So the ion 3 chloride plus sulfur foxide in the presence of moisture, we are going to get green ion 2 chloride plus hydrochloric acid plus sulfuric acid. So in this case, we'll see that the sulfur foxide has reduced ion 3 chloride and as well, it has been oxidized from being sulfur foxide to being sulfuric acid, having the sulfate ions. So here we are speaking about the SO2 being oxidized to sulfate ions. So apart from that, lastly, uh, lastly, let's look at reaction with hydrogen peroxide. So what happens when sulfur foxide reacts with hydrogen peroxide? So if sulfur foxide is bubbled through hydrogen peroxide, this, it is going to reduce the hydrogen peroxide from being hydrogen peroxide to being water molecules, as you can see in the reaction. So remember, the hydrogen peroxide is going to be reduced from being hydrogen peroxide to being water molecules. And then the sulfur foxide is going to be oxidized to sulfate ions. So that is what happens as far as the reducing properties of sulfur for oxide is concerned. So apart from that, let's now go to letter D. Uh, so that was letter C, the reducing properties of sulfur foxide. So let's now go to letter D. So letter, B, letter D, we are going to speak about now the oxidizing properties or the oxidizing actions of sulfur foxide. So remember in letter C we have dealt with the reducing properties. Now we are dealing with the oxidizing properties of sulfur for oxide. So for the first oxidizing property of sulfur foxide, we see that it automatically puts off a burning splint as it encourages magnesium metal to continue burning. So this sulfur foxide encourages magnesium metal to continue burning. So magnesium metal is going to extract the oxygen from sulfur foxide to continue burning, thus forming magnesium 2 oxide. While the sulfur is going to come out of being sulfur foxide to being a sulfur, uh, a sulfur powder. So the sulfur in the sulfur foxide will be removed or the oxygen from sulfur foxide will be removed and taken by magnesium and then sulfur will remain as a powder. So you see that sulfur foxide puts off a burning splint immediately. Why? Because burning splint doesn't have enough energy to break down the bond between sulfur and oxygen. But when a burning magnesium is lowered in a gas jar full of sulfur foxide, it will continue to burn. This is because magnesium breaks uh, the energy by which hot magnesium metal or a burning magnesium produces is able to break the sulfur to sulfur and oxygen bond, as you can see in this reaction. So in this reaction, you see that very hot magnesium is able to break the sulfur foxide to sulfur powder and oxygen gas. As this happens, as the magnesium continues to burn, magnesium is now going to use this oxygen to continue with combustion, thus forming magnesium 2 oxide. So this question in an exam can be framed in such a way. Explain why a burning splint will be extinguished immediately when placed in a gas jar full of sulfur foxide while a burning magnesium continues to burn in a gas jar full of sulfur 4 oxide. The answer is simple. A burning splint doesn't produce enough energy to break down the bond between magnesium, uh, uh, between sulfur and oxygen. So since it does not produce enough energy, so it is unable to extract the oxygen from sulfur foxide to continue combustion. While a burning magnesium produces a lot of energy. This energy is able to break down the sulfur oxygen bond to sulfur and oxygen. Therefore, magnesium uses the oxygen molecules formed to continue combustion. So that is the answer to that step. So in this uh, place, we see that sulfur foxide is able to oxidize magnesium. So sulfur foxide is able to give magnesium the oxygen as sulfur itself will remain intact as an element. So sulfur foxide in this case will say that it has oxidized magnesium and then as well it has been reduced from being sulfur foxide to being a sulfur element. So that was letter D. So let's look at letter E, reaction with carbon. So what happens when sulfur reacts with carbon? So also we'll see that this is also another oxidizing property of sulfur, whereby 
if sulfur foxide reacts with carbon, you'll see that carbon is a strong reducing agent. So this carbon is going to extract the oxygen from sulfur, forming carbon four oxide. A sulfur will remain from being a gas to being a sulfur powder, which is yellow in color. So it can also be said like this. Sulfur is going to oxidize carbon from being carbon to carbon foxide. A sulfur itself will be, sulfur foxide will be reduced from being sulfur foxide to being a sulfur powder. So that is uh, another oxidizing property of sulfur. And then the other reaction is reaction with hydrogen sulfide. So whereby we see that these are two gases now reacting. So we have hydrogen sulfide is a gas, sulfur foxide is also a gas. So you see that these two gases cannot be able to react. They cannot be able to interact. So they must be moist. So whereby we see that these gases, when they are dry, they do not, they cannot, and they will never react. But when moist, they react to form sulfur powder and water in liquid form. That is when they are moist. So when they are moist, they react to form sulfur powder and water in liquid form. So here, sulfur foxide will act as an oxidizing agent, whereby it is going to give hydrogen, sulfide, its oxygen, and as well, it itself is going to remain a sulfur element. So you see that when hydrogen sulfide reacts with sulfur foxide, you are going to get sulfur, uh, sulfur powder, which is a solid plus water molecules as per the reaction that you can see. So sulfur foxide is going to oxidize the hydrogen sulfide from being, uh, from being hydrogen sulfide to water. And then as well, it is going to be reduced from sulfur foxide to form a sulfur, uh, sulfur solid. Thank you.